Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Paul, and where we're going, we don't need tracks. We are back with our Back to the Future breakdown to talk about the final part of this classic film trilogy. This is easily one of my favourite Clint Eastwood films, and in it we see as Marty desperately tries to save Doc. Now, the entire premise of the movie was set up by a line in part two, in which Doc talked about what his hopes and dreams were. My favourite historical era, the old west, the time travelling, is just too dangerous. Better that I devote myself to studying the other great history of the universe. Women. Not only does he get to go back in time, but he also gets to meet the love of his life. There's a lot to uncover, unpack, and talk about, and great Scott, I can't wait to get into it. So come with me, my partner in time, smash that thumbs up button, and let us get into Back to the Future 3. Now unlike the gap between part 1 and 2, part 3 was all pretty much in place when it came to production. Shot back to back, this latter film didn't have the issues that the first two did in terms of recasting people like Eric Stoltz and Crispin Glover. Everything was locked in and ready to go, but with it being two movies, there was still a lot to get through. Both were filmed together in the course of 11 months, with Zemeckis having to shoot part 3 while editing part 2. Nowadays, you could just do it online digitally on your laptop, but back then they had to have physical film reels and also big editing rooms. Zemeckis would film part 3, finish for the day, fly out to Burbank and then work on the edit. He'd then make the changes, go to sleep and fly back to Cali to shoot part 3. Going on for about a month, this is something he said wiped him out, but he managed to get the two films released within a year of each other. Anyway, that's his short but sweet making of trivia, and that takes us back to the future. And the film begins with the first showing of the 75th anniversary Universal logo. Not only was this the company celebrating the last 75 years of its work, but it also thematically helps to set the stage for the film. We will of course be going back through the ages to witness how things all began in the town of Hill Valley. Picking up immediately after part 2, we begin like the last two did, with the date at the bottom displaying when this is. In it we get the ending of part 1, and then watch as Marty goes back to the future. This then segues into part 2's final scene, and we get Doc Brown's collapse. A really cool thing you can do here though, is that you can actually end part 1 and then jump from here immediately to part 3. Seeing these from Doc's perspective, you can just watch these back to back and then learn about what happened in part 2 directly from Marty. Don't do it mate, don't bloody do it you sicko, going from 1 to 3, uh, but it shows how well crafted these films are in terms of cohesiveness. After the title sequence, we then cut to the sky, juxtaposing the bright clouds that opened up part 2. This thematically showed a possible sunny future, whereas in this instance, it symbolises the darkness with the way the film ended. Returning to Doc Brown's home, we then get some cool easter eggs that reference the first film. In Doc's garage at the start, we could see four science figures, with this being Isaac Newton, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Edison, and lastly Albert Einstein. Cut to Doc's home in 1955, and he also had these images right above the fireplace. These return in the exact same spot, and we then cut down to see the letter Doc wrote being dried out on the fire. There's the hoverboard, the dog Copernicus, and we then cut to the TV playing Howdy Doody. This was a kid's show set in the Old West, foreshadowing the trip that Marty makes throughout the movie. The theme of the show was initiating the first screenplay draft for part one, before it was changed out for that long opening one shot. After realising Marty's there, he then backs into the bathroom, and we can see a clock hanging up on the wall. Cut back to part one. I was standing on the edge of my toilet hanging a clock. The porcelain was wet. I slipped, hit my head on the edge of the sink. And when I came to, I had a revelation. A vision. A picture in my head. A picture of this. This is what makes time travel possible. And this is the same clock that he was referring to then. Going into the garage, we can then see a fire extinguisher that was used in part one to put out the fire caused by the model. This was notably almost empty, explaining how Doc's house burned down, which we learned from that news report. The model car is then shown at 8 minutes and 54, when we see Marty pull it out the bin. We also get the crude model of Hill Valley, before then cutting to the mind reading machine Doc wore in that film. This room is a perfect recreation of it, with the model even having Doc's wristwatch in the clock tower. This is set at 10.04, which is when the lightning strike hit it. This is given further reference at 41.52, when we can see the clock face in the background at the train station. This is set at 10.04, which brings things full circle from how it starts and ends. And it's all connected. Back with Doc, he finishes his letter, and we can see two watches on his wrists. This is something the character wears throughout the franchise, again showing his big obsession with time. 
Now, technically, this should start on the timeline that creates something else in 1985. So far we've had the original one, and then the Lone Pine Mall one from the end of part 1. Part 2 had the alternate 85 before Marty went back and changed things to the end of part 3. That means that this moment didn't alter the timeline, and that it was actually always meant to happen. I think, and it's lots of timey wimey wibbly wobbly stuff, but if you view this in that way it makes more sense. Doc ended up ripping Marty's letter at the end of part 1, but we saw that he'd put it back together. I think I'm getting a letter from himself here, yeah, maybe what could have changed his mind, but yeah, that's probably me retconning it, because I doubt they planned it out that much. Oh, uh, that does make it slightly more enjoyable, and he also leaves himself a note saying, Remember to walk him twice a day, and that he only likes canned dog food. This is something that we saw piling up at the start of part 1, and I do appreciate that they kind of went back and referenced this. Now from this point they go out to the cemetery, which is where they dig up the DeLorean. We hear Doc say, That's by the time I attempted to reach the center of the earth, I've been reading my favourite author, Jules Verne. Now these lines are very important, as it lays the seeds for his Jules Verne obsession. Clara later says she's a fan of him too, and we watch as the pair start to bond over him. When the pair return in the future, we also meet their kids, which we learn are called both Jules and Verne. Beyond that though, this speech has a little easter egg, as Zark talks about one of his favourite books. That is, Just like in Journey to the Center of the Earth! Which the future Doc references in How He Buries the Car. In the novel, a professor and his nephew went to the center of the Earth, and they were following clues left by an adventurer. In order to lead them into the passages, he engraved his initials, which were AS. This is something that Doc Brown does too, as we see his initials ELB carved into the wood. After finding the DeLorean, they see the chip and Doc says, No wonder this circuit fails, says made in Japan. Japan of course dominated the economy in the 80s, and Mod even worked for a Japanese corporation during part 2. Now from this point they discover Doc's grave, and we can see that the death date's September 7th. In the film, Doc was actually shot on September 5th, meaning that it took another 2 days for him to die. From this point on they then study Buford Tannen, who got a little cameo during part 2. This had him with a slightly different look, as the photo used here was an early makeup test. Gail wanted Buford to represent Biff's worst intentions, realising a person who could do what they wanted. Looking at films, they based him on Liberty Valance from the classic western The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Why don't you get yourself a fresh steak on me? Show's over for now. Eight o'clock Monday, bro. If you ain't here, I'll hunt you and shoot you down like a duck. We then see the history of the McFlies, with Marty then saying, Your family, your relatives? My great grandfather's name was William. That's him. Good looking guy. Guy is obviously played by Fox, foreshadowing how he also plays Seamus as well. The one in the book is a man called William, who Marty later meets as a baby in his crib. This is a scene that calls back to his uncle Joey, who he also met as a kid during part one. Doc also mentions his family name was the Von Browns, which is a reference to the scientist Werner Von Braun. This is one of Germany's leading rocket scientists who got brought to the US during Operation Paperclip. Marty then looks through some photos, with one of a woman being of a saloon girl. She's called Dolores Miskin, with her possibly being a relation to Sylvia Miskin. In the game we met her and learned that she was George's mother, tying it all together from this little photograph. To the right of her we can also see the saloon, which is a location that we go to in the film. Lastly, we see the photo of Doc Brown, who at that point poses in front of the new clock. The time on it says 8.08, with IMDb trivia stating this is a reference to 88 miles per hour. At this point, Marty then vows to save him, and we see as he brings up your boy Clint Eastwood. Clint who? That's right. You haven't heard of him yet. Now look what Marty does at that moment, mate, and you can see that he points at the wall. Going back a bit, we can see that this is him pointing at posters, which are for Tarantula and Revenge of the Creature. Both of these featured a young Clint Eastwood who, at the time, hadn't made his name yet. Eastwood gets a lot of deep cuts in the film, with Marty using his moves to help save his life. During part 2, Biff watched a fistful of dollars, which had him using a makeshift bulletproof vest. This is something Marty does in the film as well, with him using a metal stove door during their duel. When Doc shoots Marty down from the hanging rope, it's also something Eastwood's character did in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. This is how he rescued the character Tuco, who was also made to hang from a rope as well. Pale Rider was shot at the same place that this was, with them even using some of the buildings for the background of Hill Valley. On top of that, we also have Eastwood Ravine, which is what we see the signs say at the end of the film. This was formerly known as Clayton Ravine because it's where Clara Clayton was originally going to fall into. 
Eastwood was asked for permission to use his name, which he gave after saying that he really loved the reference. Now the idea to hit the Wild West actually came from Fox when they were on set joking about where things could go. Fox said that he'd love to hit the Old West and have Marty and Doc dressed up as cowboys. There was the idea that they could go there in the second film, but Zemeckis wanted to delay it until we got to part 3. They also realised when crafting the script that they'd gotten everything out of Marty that they felt that they could get. Thus the attention was turned to Doc Brown, with a love story being crafted out of the character Clara Clayton. This was written with Mary Steenburgen in mind, who'd previously been in the film time after time. This was also centred around time travel, with it having elements set in San Francisco. They gave a little nod to this during the script when they say, How far does the 8 o'clock train go? Well, San Francisco is the end of the line. Although this was written with her in the part, Mary initially turned down the role. However, her kids wouldn't let it drop, and eventually they convinced her to take part in the film. Beyond this, Zemeckis and Gale also wanted to pay tribute to the genre, which in the 90s had kind of died out. However, it did get somewhat of a revival, with Dances with Wolves winning the best picture the next year. Unforgiven was about to roll into production, and you could argue that this dropped at the right time. So Zemeckis, he looked at getting in veteran actors, who would be notable faces that people recognise from the westerns. In the saloon, we have the quote-unquote old-timers, who are played by Pat Buttram, Harry Carey Jr., and lastly, Dub Taylor. These were pushed in the behind the scenes stuff to show how much attention they were paying to the genre. Ronald Reagan was also approached for the film too, with the idea he'd play the mayor of Hill Valley. Reagan's someone who we, we've talked a lot about in these breakdowns, and if you want to hear about those stories then go back to our part 1 video. He was then included in part 2, with the hopes then being that he'd show up in the flesh for the third and final film. Unfortunately, he ended up declining, which is a shame due to how much his notoriety in westerns would have made his cameo pop. Now back with Doc, he says, For all, we can't risk sending you back into a populated area or to a spot that's geographically unknown. You don't want to crash into some tree that once existed in the past. This is a little nod to the first film, as in that, Marty ended up crashing into Peabody's tree, which changed them all's name. He also says, Remember where you're going, there are no roads. You get it, you get it, mate, with it being a callback to this line. Where we're going, we don't need roads. Driving at the sign, we, th we then get what's probably my favourite time travel transition in the entire trilogy. Heading at the Native Americans, this is then turned into real life ones, being at that spot in the past. After encountering the cavalry, we see that they have a flag with 31 stars on it, which is what was carried at the time. Unfortunately, the fuel line's been damaged though, and Marty's then chased out of the cave by a bear. Now, not to be a dickhead, mate, not to be a dick, but this plot hole, it, it always did my head in a bit. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. You see, the fuel leaking, it means they can't get it up to top speed, and thus they have to rely on the train. However, 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 there's actually two DeLoreans in the past right now. The first of these is the one Moddy's driving, but there's also the one that Doc Brown arrived in. This is the one that he buries underground, and they end up digging up in the future. So technically, the pair could go out and get this, get the fuel, and then from there travel back. At this point, Moddy then comes across his ancestor's farm, and he ends up crashing into a fence. On his shirt, we can also see the Adam symbol, which is something that was first observed during the 1880s. Knocked out, we then get a scene that's sort of like poetry they rhyme. This is Marty waking up and being nursed by Leah Thompson, which is something that happened in the prior two films. Now Leah, or her character, being married to Seamus, I, I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole, and how Mrs. McFly also looks like his mother. His dad m must have married his cousin, look, we're not going to go that way, uh, and that's the last I want to say about that. Anyway, Seamus busts in carrying some rabbits, with the pair then talking about them over their supper. This again was shot using the Vista Glide, which allowed an actor to play two characters in the same scene. This is something that was difficult to pull off, and even in Terminator 2, they ended up hiring twins to get around the problem. Yep, Linda Hamilton as a twin, and that's how she's able to do it in the scene at the end. Terminator 2, right down on the channel right now. Why? Now, Marty also ends up spitting out the ball bearings, which came from the gun that was used to kill the rabbits. After a good night's sleep, Marty travels into town, which is where we get the classic shot of him coming across Hill Valley. This is obviously shot in a similar way across the trilogy, with a camera pulling up to then reveal the town. Beyond that, we also get a little cool detail, which we can see with Joe Statler's horses. Statler's Studebaker Motors appeared in 1955, and it could be seen just after Marty travels back to 85. As he walks in further, we can see the A. Jones manure wagon, which, like the McFlies, was kept in the family. We'll not, we'll not go down that rabbit hole, though, but uh, jump over to 1955, and the name on the manure truck says D. Jones. Lastly is the Wells Fargo building, who are a bank that still operate today. However, by 55, they had left the premises, with this now becoming the Bluebird Motel. 
I did try looking up the Marshalls sign with Stinky Lomax, but unfortunately I couldn't find any trivia. How about what we get to Saloon, which is in the exact same spot as Lou's Diner. This ended up becoming Cafe Eddie's, and at this point the barman says, You want water? You better go dunk your head in the horse trough. Now after Doc ends up getting the wake-up juice, the first thing he does is run outside and do this in order to get some water. Either way, he kind of carries on the trope of Marty ordering the wrong thing. Frank, give me a Pepsi free. You want a Pepsi, pal? You're gonna pay for it. Ah, uh, I'll have, uh, ice water. Now on top of this, we get the repeating moment in the franchise in which a tannin walks in and says, Hey, McFly! Hey, Gramps! Hey, McFly! Now, you might also notice that Biff's gang is different, and this was done for practical reasons. All of these were highly skilled horsemen, so shooting these scenes would become a lot easier. It's way easier to teach someone to act than it is to ride a horse, and it, it kind of reminds me of the, the Armageddon DVD commentary. I asked Michael why it was easier to train oil drillers to become astronauts than it was to train astronauts to become oil drillers, and he told me to shut, shut, shut the fuck up. So that, that was the end of that talk. He was like, you know, Ben, just shut up, okay? You know, this is a real plan, all right? I was like, you mean it's a real plan at NASA to train oil drillers? He was like, just shut your mouth. <laughs> Anyway, this time Biff ends up shooting at his feet and we watch as Marty moonwalks. Part 2 referenced him quite heavily with him appearing in Cafe 80s and the girls room in the Nightmare timeline of 1985. Chased in the street, we then see the hanging, which is something that actually nearly killed Fox. Unfortunately, because of YouTube censorship, we can't show these hanging scenes, but I, I thought I'd at least just go over what happens in them. Now, the white shot's on him, but when filming the close-ups, the creative team decided they had to get right up to him. They did a couple of shots without the box and the rope around his neck with his hands reaching up to hold in between the noose. Unfortunately on the third try he miscalculated the position and ended up misplacing his hand. This caused him to block an artery and in the end it made him pass out. And after this Fox started getting a twitching little finger which he stated wouldn't go away. In his biography Lucky Man he said he then went to the doctors believing that this was caused by the stunt. After numerous doctor visits, he was told it could be linked to that, but then the condition worsened and spread throughout his body. Eventually, he was sadly diagnosed with Parkinson's, but it was said that the stunt wasn't linked in with it. It's really sad, and often is a talking point of this scene, so I thought I'd clear that up because I know there's lots of different things said about it. Now from this point, Doc ends up saving him, which is when Buford warns him he'll get a bullet in his back. No prices for guessing what that is, and in Doc's lab, we see he's constructed a massive ice machine. The mayor arrives and reminds him about picking up a teacher, which is of course how he meets Clara. Now in what's a great little detail, we can see her before she's properly introduced in the scene at 4151. If you look closely just behind Marty, you will see Clara standing with her back turned. She's someone who was supposed to get picked up from here, but with that not happening, she then went into the ravine. This is even given to us in a line when he's going over the map, talking about what the original name was. This map calls Clayton Ravine Shonash Ravine. That must be the old Indian name for it. As we know, they ended up saving Clara, and in the end it's Marty who's thought to have gone over it. Mentioned it before, but that's why Clayton becomes Eastwood, but in saving her, it doesn't really change the timeline. Clara is someone who can be taken away by Doc because in either possible outcome, she's not present beyond this point. Had she went into the ravine or got taken out of time, nothing in the future would have been changed. Doc wasn't originally there, which is why she went over, and this explains why Doc calls it Clayton Ravine. The second instance was when he picked her up, and then got shot in the back by Buford Tannen. The third timeline is the one where Moddy goes back to help, and then helps Doc, who also saves Clara. So that's why Doc thinks it's called Clayton Ravine, even though her name also appeared on his grave. I know people think it's a paradox, but it's lots of timey wimey wibbly wobbly stuff, and I do, I must admit, I love the detail of her just standing at the station. It's kind of fate, and even though Doc initially decides to completely avoid her, we see what it leads to in the end. Marty describes love at first sight being like lightning. You meet the right girl, it just hits you, it's like lightning. Marty, please don't say that. And this is because Doc had to deal with it on the clock tower, and it's also what sent him back during part two. Realising there's no way to get the car up to 88, they then try horse riding, making gasoline, and finally settle on the train. Now, another nitpick people have is that once Buford's taken out, there's not really any reason for them to rush the train plot. I suppose, mate, but it's a movie and it needs, needs a ticking clock, needs some excitement at the end, rather than just them sitting around and being like, well, tans out the way, let's take time to build a time machine. I think even fourth dimensionally, they realise they can travel across the ravine and land safely in 1985. 
Saving Clara, though, Doc sent Tom in it, and we get a classic head of hot story, which, ah, young love. Now, Doc wants to make up for the cop being destroyed, and he says, I feel somewhat responsible for what happened. This is because the man left her at the station, and yet nearly got that poor woman killed. Either way, this gets him more into her life, but he's torn between just letting go of her or subscribing in the end, which he should always do. Anyway, at this point, we get a crude model of the town. I apologize for the crudity of this model, but yeah, I just... Yeah, no, Dark, it's not the scale. This is a callback to this. Please excuse the crudity of this model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. It's good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Guys may do with what they had at the time, including bullet casings on the back of the model car. Now, according to the wiki for the movie, Clara was a reference to Mark Twain's daughter, who was called Clara Clemens. According to the story, she was riding horseback, and then the animal got frightened and dashed towards a cliff. Saved by her fiancé, he managed to catch up to them and stopped her from going over the 50-foot drop. After a visit from Clayton, that man wants to start dating, and from here, we head to the town festival. Starting at the clock, we see his fireworks like the tower, which were purposely put in to mirror the lightning strikes. So we've had a flash and a bang when it started ticking, and this would also be there when it ended up stopping. Doc and Marty then end up getting a photo together, which is taken by the movie's director of photography, the legendary Dean Cundy. Marty says, Smile, Doc. While he doesn't. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, this is because at the time, people didn't smile in photographs, so Marty's, he's bloody, he's bloody pulling his leg. He's made you look a right knob. And from here we cut to the band, which are headed up by ZZ Top. They do their signature spin, and apparently ended up playing for the cast in between takes. According to the behind the scenes wiki, the ZZ Top manager apparently tried to get them to use their famous car for this film. This was turned down because they already had the DeLorean, but it did make an appearance in the band's music video for the film, which is called Double Back. We can also hear that to buy a cold peacemaker costs $12, showing how inflation or well deflation changed the prices of the time. Marty shows his skills calling back to part two, and this is riffing off from when he played Gundam. The guy running it also says, I just told you that even a baby can handle this weapon. Surely you're not afraid to try something that a baby could do. With the kids in part two saying, That's like a baby's toy. At this point, Buford's gang roll into town, where we meet Marshal Strickland. A, he's back, and after he gets them to hand over their weapons, he says this to his son. Remember that word. Discipline. Cut back to part two, and we can see the word discipline under Strickland's name at the hour 19 mark. Passed down through the generations, the man's been handing out discipline, and we were originally going to see him die in this film. When Beefit's arrested, this is carried out by his deputy, rather than being by Marshal Strickland himself. This is because Buford was originally arrested for the murder of Strickland, which he'd do by shooting him in the back. They had to redub the lines, saying that he'd killed him, and they masked this change by cutting to Doc and Marty. Buford Tannen, you're under arrest for robbing the Pine City stage. You got anything to say? I just thought it was too depressing, and hey, it's a fun movie, mate. You don't want to hear about marshals getting murdered and shot in the back while a kid watches on. Anyway, at the dance, we see Marty holds up a plate with frisbee on air that he later uses as a way to stop Buford. This is a callback to what he did in part two, when we saw him throw the matches holder at the evil Biff. However, beyond this, we see it's a pie pan, which is a neat little bit of history for you guys to learn now. You see, the frisbee pie company, that was a real thing, with them operating during the late 1800s. It was then discovered these pans were thrown for fun, and hence the frisbee, it was officially invented. I said that's ten, you gutless yellow pie slinger! Saving Doc, Marty's put into the crosshairs, with him then being called Yeller. They repeat the scene from part two, with the same blocking that Marty had when 55 Biff called him a chicken at the dance. He also gets a saying wrong, Hunt you and shoot you down like a duck. It's dog, Buford. Shoot him down like a dog. Calling back to how Biff kept messing up the tree thing. Now why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? So why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? It's leave, you idiot. Make like a tree and leave. You sound like a damn fool when you say it wrong. Over Learning from Seamus, he discovers he had a brother named Martin who ended up dying because he refused to walk away. It's at this point that the penny starts to drop and Marty realizes he has to be more careful. Out with Brown and Clara, she says, Uh huh. That one's called Copernicus. With that being the name of a scientist that the doc would name his dog after. He then starts alluding to the future and talks about how much the world will change in the next hundred years. She wonders if man will ever step foot on the moon or if they'll hit the thumbs up button, and in the end, he starts quoting Vern. Shooting stars fly, and back at docks, we see as a machine set up to make a cooked breakfast. 
This is of course similar to the first film, in which he had something set up to give Einstein his food. These gadgets and gizmos took inspiration from Caractus Pot, who was a crazy inventor and chitty chitty bang bang. This character ended up inspiring Doc's luck, and Marty in the scene also takes from a famous movie. That is Taxi Driver, with him riffing off the mirror scene in that as he practices for Tannen. Later on he of course also wears similar clothes to Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name, which at the end his brother even points out. Norm. Hey Marty, who are you supposed to be, Clint Eastwood? <laughs> Spotting the gravestone, we see that Doc's name's gone in the photo, implying that it could be Marty instead. Great Scott! I know, this is heavy. Now that, that's one of my favourite lines in the franchise, as the two characters have finally swapped catchphrases. Such a good little line, and I also love how Doc's hat has the bullet hole in it from where he was shot the night before. Alluding to what happens to Marty in the future, this builds off the back of what Doc touched upon in part 2. This kind of speaks to the themes of the film, and when thinking about it, it's an opposite to George. You see George in the first film, he was pretty much a doormat that let everyone treat him exactly how they wanted. In the end, he had to stand up for himself, which is something that Marty had no problem doing. However, with Marty it means stuff goes from 0 to 100, or 0 to 88, and this in the end leads to him injured in a crash. This means that he can't play guitar properly, and becomes an old man trying to strum away desperately. What? George had to become ready to fight when necessary, whereas Marty has to learn when he needs to walk away. Overall, they become way more balanced and thoughtful characters that do what's right when it's needed, but not to their own detriment. Marty then convinces Doc to break things off because he says that he's a scientist. He wants him to use his brain and not stay in the past, and in some ways it reflects Marty in part two. I caution you about disrupting the continuum for your own personal benefit, therefore I must do no less. This is in the same way that Marty stole the almanac, and he'd be messing with time to get what he wants. Personally though, I think leaving Clara in the past, that, that's going to cause more issues mate, so it might be time to go out and, you know, old Yellera. I don't know, maybe we can just take Clara with us. Oh yeah, yeah, you take her to the future. Now they then roll the car off and Marty says, Wow, that worked great. This is actually a little known to the production crew, who were worried that a DeLorean wouldn't fit the track. However, luckily for them, they realised when putting it together that the car actually had the exact measurements required to roll on the railway. Thus, no changes to the car were really needed to be made, and they could just plonk it on the tracks and then keep on moving. Job's done, let's finish early. This is the way. Now, after getting slapped by Clara for telling the truth, we then see his Doc goes out to drown his sorrows. The explanation he gives here is also worded very similar to how Marty tells Doc that he's from the future in the first one. I'm from the future. I'm from the future. I came here in a time machine that I invented. I came here in a time machine that you invented. And tomorrow I have to go back to the year 1985. Now I need your help to get back to the year 1985. Guy stands at the bar with one shot, one shot. Wait, is that is that Doc from the Thing? That's bl that's bloody Doc from the Thing. You son of a bitch. As he chats with Doc, you can see him holding barbed wire, which might make you think, what what the heckins is going on? Well, this figure is actually John Wayne Gates, who worked as a salesman for the Southern Wire Company. As electricity and wires became more commonplace, the man in the company ended up making a fortune. With this, Gates would then go on to found the Texas Oil Company, which years later got renamed to Texaco. Texaco is something that appeared in the first two films, and I love how they managed to get its origins in here. Waking up, Marty then rushes into town, and this is so he can grab Doc and the pair can escape. We catch him still holding on to the one shot, and can tell by the bottle that he's not drank anything. Now according to IMDb Trivia, this is a nod to support your local gunfighter, in which Doc Schultz's character ended up drinking way too much. After taking every shot of whiskey, then passed out, which is when the bartender knocked up some wake-up juice. Doc Schultz was played by Dub Taylor, who again's in that group of the three old-timers. This wake-up juice ingredients includes Tabasco sauce, with a label being the version used in the 1880s. I genuinely always used to wonder whether whether something like this would work, and let me know below if you've ever had a crazy hangover cure uh, that's along the lines of this. Now he's lured out by Buford calling him a chicken, and I love how Marty says it's not 8 o'clock yet. It's not 8 o'clock yet! It is by my watch! And we can obviously see by the clock in the same moment that the time the time's still 5 to mate, you got 5 minutes. Now another issue that's with this duel is that the creative team realised Marty couldn't kill Buford. If he did, then Biff would never be born, and then we'd have both Doc and Marty wiped out as well. So what they did is that they realised Marty shouldn't kill him, and instead he was just going to fight him with his brain and fists. 
Percy confronts him and we get some classic western iconography, such as the fingers dangling above the gun. Dropping his and taking the shot, Molly then reveals the bulletproof vest. Vests like this have shown up before and it's how Doc managed to survive the terrorists in part 1. If you listen really really closely, you can also hear the bullet hitting the metal which was put in by the sound designers. This is also the second time he's tricked a tandem by faking his own death as he jumped off Biff's casino during part 2. He then beats Buford up, cracks the grave and then dumps him in manure. I hate manure. The kid then gives him his gun back which the wiki states was supposed to have some other lines. Apparently in the novelization, the kid asks where Moddy learned to do that and he then says that he saw it in a movie. The boy's mother then calls out his name which we learn is David Walk Griffith. This filmmaking pioneer was born in 1875 and he'd go on to make movies which is why they said it here. Now from here we then see as they race to catch the train but the bad news is Clara has already gotten off. Holding it out we then get what's a pretty cool easter egg that I did mention in our part 2 video but in case you didn't see that then here, here's what it is. But Doc Brown's bandana is actually made from the shirt that we could see him wearing throughout part 2. This shirt had a train and two horsemen chasing after it foreshadowing what was going to happen in this scene. These railway scenes are also shot on the Sierra Railroad which was used in the Western High Noon. We can also see that the locomotive number is 131 but, but mate, according to the trivia yeah, these weren't made available until 1891. I'm bloody furious, it's the worst movie ever. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Anyway they start heading to the ravine with Doc blowing the train whistle and saying Zemeckis would later reference this in Polar Express when the train whistle was blown there too. I've wanted to do that my whole life. Clara tries to climb on board, shit hits the fan and using the hoverboard Doc manages to save her. We then see as the pair skate away and Molly finally gets to go home. The train bit used for this was actually a model with it then going over the edge into the ravine. Back in the future, or past for us, the car gets destroyed by a train and that finally puts an end to the DeLorean. According to IMDb Trivia, the driver of the diesel train, they, they, they said to him, look you're gonna smash through the car, it might be dangerous, are, are you sure you still want to do it? He turned around and said, and to quote Doc Brown, I wanted to do that all my life! Trains driving into cars can obviously be very traumatic for the driver if someone's inside, but I, I can imagine you you would want to, you'd have that itch that wanted to be scratched where you just plow into a car, not with people in, but you know what I mean, uh, but it's very rare that drivers would actually get to do this. So him getting to do this was a dream come true, and I love seeing it getting smashed like the like button. Doc wanting to destroy it is something he's said in every film, and that also being what started off the whole western setup that they established in part 2. It's destroyed. Like Returning to Line Estate, Molly makes it home where we catch his truck in the garage. Biff says he's about to put on a second coat, which is a reference to these lines in the franchise. Hey Gramps! I told you two coats of wax on my car, not just one! Uh, now Biff, I want to make sure that we get two coats of wax this time, not just one. Dear Biff, 40! I, I didn't mean to scare you, I, I didn't recognize you in those clothes. What the I, hell are you doing? Uh, just putting on the second coat now. <laughs> Still ain't bloody done it, eh? I should knock you the fuck out for what you've caused mate, you, you realise the shitstorm you've caused. I'm travelling across to Jennifer, we see it's all fine and dandy and then it, it was absolutely okay leaving her in the crime ridden 1985. Yep, just leave a young attractive woman on the porch when people are driving by shooting at houses and just go back in time mate, it's gonna be fine. Now, a little bit of trivia, this was the only scene shot during part 2 that appeared as a new one for this movie. From here they travel out to Helldale and we can see the sign for it says the address for success with it saying the address for suckers in the alternate timeline. Needle Zen pulls up playing the power of love and he says <laughs> The Big M Hey the Big M How's it hanging McFly? How's it hanging McFly? Hey Needles Hey Needles What's the matter? Chicken? Unless you want everyone in division to think you're chicken. Marty also tried to play the power of love on his guitar back in part 2 after being fired because of needles ruining his life again. Calling him chicken, we see as Marty ends up reversing, which we get a clue by from how he moves the gear stick. Marty clearly puts it in reverse, and thus he ends up missing the silver Rolls Royce. 
the your fired fax text then disappears and we go out onto the train tracks now i don't get how the train signal knows the train's coming from the past but it, it does somehow and yet yeah, we see his doc returns the train's rocking his initials elb which as we said earlier were left on the wood covering the delorean also, I love how the doors open up like the DeLorean, and hey, if you want to time travel, you might as well do it in style. We also see their sons, Jules and Vern, and hey, go gonna point something out that was brought up on a podcast years ago. I can't remember which one, I think it was kind of funny, but since then, I've never not noticed it. Now, as Doc says, the future hasn't been written yet. We can see one of the kids doing a weird gesture with his hand and then pointing at his pants. Apparently right, apparently the kid was, was desperate for a wee, and what he was doing... He was signalling to his mum behind the camera that he needed to go. Don't know why, don't know why they left it in the movie, but hey, I hope you never work again. I hope you never work again, kid, because you ruined the movie, you scumbag. Anyway, but in the call back to the end of part one, we see as a train takes off just like the DeLorean and then flies directly to the screen. Instead of getting a message teasing more to come, we finally get some text pop-ups saying the end. However, though there's been lots of talk that they'd never make a sequel, I dug deep and found out there were plans for part 4. This would see Doc and the family going to Roswell to witness an alien crash in 1947. Marty was going to be absent from most of the script, but he would appear in a cameo role at some point. However, as we know, that never came to be, and both Gail and Zemeckis have both said they'll never allow sequels to be made. As long as they're alive, at least, which I'm guessing some Hollywood executives being like, challenge accepted! However, we did get an animated series which ended up running for two seasons and also had a parody trailer for part 4 which starred both Fox and Lloyd. Personally, I hope we don't get a sequel or reboot and I think some things are just best left alone. Let me know below what you think and I'd love to hear what you guys would do if you could go back in time. Personally, I'd go back to my part 2 video and I'd change it so that I said the Jaws boxes in the windows were LGN games and not VHS. And maybe, maybe if I concentrate... I, ca I can do that, maybe. And here we can see the Jaws 1 and 2 game boxes by LGN. We did it! We changed the timeline, and now we can rest. So what's next? Well, we will be working on Dune, Blade 2, Wicker Man, and Terminator 3 breakdowns very soon before shifting over to A Clockwork Orange. I need to stop promising Terminator 3, but I, w I will get to it, I promise. There's just so many movies I'm watching that I'm like, this would be a great breakdown, this would be a great breakdown. And Terminator 3, I'm like, don't, don't know if I want to do that. But it is a promise, even though I need to stop promising. And, and in either way, thank you for joining me in this journey. And if you want to support the channel and get to listen and watch these breakdowns early, then please hit the join button. For 99 pence and 99 cents a month, you'll get early access and it makes a massive difference to the channel. By the way, thank you for sitting with us. I've been Paul, you've been the best, and this has been Heavy. There's that word again, heavy. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull?